Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo, the Heron establishment of the Ministry of Technology, an almost ultra-modern building, is set in rural grounds, well back from the road, with lawns and shrubs all around it. It is always, of course, well guarded. On a certain evening, not so very long ago, the security guard on the main gate hitched up a holstered revolver over his very ample waist, surveyed the darkness, sighed, and began pacing the gravel. He glanced briefly towards the car park. A man in a white laboratory technician's coat and carrying a small briefcase left a car and walked casually towards the main building. Another car swung out of the car park and the occupant waved to the guard. Bye! No, sir! When the guard turned back to the gate, he noticed that the white-coated figure had disappeared. The guard continued his idle pacing. In some bushes near the main building, a young man slipped off the white coat and pulled a black sweater with a knitted hood over his head. He then dropped to his knees and opened the case. Inside the case was a gleaming array of barrels, cartridges, bolts and stocks. With almost magical speed, the young man assembled the parts into a very lethal double-barreled shotgun. He stroked it lovingly. His eyes hardened. They became the eyes of a killer. The eyes of the man who intended destroying poor George. The Avengers. and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Episode one of this story, in which John Steed, Emma Peel, and practically everyone else, asks, Who shot poor George Oblique Stroke XR-40? The young man crouched low in the bushes. He broke the shotgun and inserted two cartridges, clicked it shut, and moved stealthily through the undergrowth. He merged into the shadows, making full use of the cover, checking his position with a thin-lipped smile of satisfaction. At a convenient point, he stopped and dropped to one knee. A light had gone on in a room in the research center. The window had a thin blind. On the blind, clearly silhouetted, was the figure of a solidly built figure seated in a chair, a figure with an impossibly square head. A man moved forward as though to question the seated figure. Seconds later, the shotgun was raised, and a split second after that, the would-be assassin didn't stop to see the result of his work, but headed for the car park, while inside the room with the window blown to pieces, Baines, a senior programmer, stared down in horror at the dark shape on the floor. It was a man-sized and shaped computer, but its dials glowed only fitfully, and its mechanism was slowing down agonizingly. No, no, who has done this to me? Oh, oh, George. The spiel? I came as quickly as I could. This way. I was about to go to a party. If this case doesn't take more than 48 hours, I may still be able to make it. Some party? I think so. 
I hope you drag me away from it for something really important. Oh, yes, really important. Murder. One of the top brains in the country. Oh? It could set us back years. Well, that seems a pretty cold-blooded way of looking at it. Well, he was rather a cold-blooded sort of fellow. Calculating, too. Oh, very calculating. Um, in here. It was the same room. The robot computer had now been laid out on the table. Two white-coated figures bent over it. It was an emergency examination. Dr. Ardmore, an expert in cybernetics, was in charge. Uh, not much more I can do here, Tobin. Uh, but any movement might upset the balance and prove fatal. We'll have to risk it. Mm. Get the theater ready. I'll operate within the hour. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, uh, good evening. Uh, evening. Dr. Ardmore, Tobin, and uh, Mrs. Peel. How do you do? And there on the table is George, a bleak stroke XR40, the most advanced electronic brain in the country. A computer? Yes. Containing the concentrated knowledge of more than 2,000 of the world's leading scientists. Digital or analog? Numbers or words, they are now perforated by a 12 bore aimed through that window. I wish I could say that I'm pleased to meet you, Mrs. Peel, but in the circumstances, <laughs> I'm a cybernetic surgeon, by the way. This is a crisis. I'm afraid I can only spare you a few minutes. Oh, we quite understand. Uh, he uh, looks in a bad way. A major op is our only chance. Any reason for this attack? Since this destruction, work of a psychopath, it must be. Must have been a well-organized psychopath. Better get him onto the stretcher. Give me a hand, Tobin. Yes, sir. Uh, on here, we can wheel him out. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 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 gently now, uh, gently, uh, gently. Yes, sir. Yes. What was that, Mrs. Peel? The attack. It was obviously well planned. The shot through the window... A cold-blooded murder. George XR never had a chance. More careful with him, you fool. Now, yes, careful. Oh, dear. All his um, insides have come apart, haven't they? Um, this wire, any of you? It could be vital. Well, there's a lot more here, too. Wires of different colors. Green, blue, red. Mostly red. Life's blood. Give them to me. Yes, but there must be a difference between a spare part and a transplant, surely. <clears throat> Uh, was George uh, working on any special project, Dr. Ardmore? Nothing strategic, if that's what you mean, Steed. Mm. A stress analysis for the Admiralty. Um, that's right, isn't it, Tobin? Uh, not, not, not quite, sir. Mr. Baines brought in a rush job late this evening. Baines? Who is Baines? One of our programmers. He's worked with George XR since the start. He was here when it happened, Mr. Steed. Uh, the tragedy, I mean. I see him. Uh, is he here now? Uh, no, he's off duty. He went home. Very cut up, of course. Of course. Uh, you've got a telephone number. I'd like to talk to him. Uh, yes, you can get the number from reception. Thank you. Well, I don't want to worry you, but I must go and get scrubbed up. We can't leave George like this. Every moment is important. This is an emergency, and I must operate at once. Tobin, after you. Careful now. Yes, sir. Now, gently, now, gently. You're not dealing with a, a mere dispensable human being. Gently. Oh, if uh, you get in touch with Baines, uh, you'll have to ask him to turn down his high thigh. Um, he's an addict. A very peculiar fellow, I'm afraid. Would one peculiar fellow appear out of place in this organization, I wonder? I shouldn't think so. A high thigh addict, hmm? How's your tympanic membrane these days, Steve? Oh, no panic. In fact, it's booming. Splendid. I'll leave Mr. Baines to you then and get back to my party. Uh, oh, no, you don't. You can't be so heartless as not to feel pity for poor George. Now, we can't very well leave him to face this major op alone. And do you realize something, Mrs. Peel? What? If they do get George a bleak stroke XR40 over this and his wheels start turning again, he could pop out one or two answers. Like the muzzle velocity of a 12-bore shotgun and the impact of a bullet fired through a glass window into a computer's jet? Would that really tell us anything, Steve? Sometime after that, Steed and Emma Peel, back in London, entered her apartment. Steed wandered across to the drinks table, poured himself a liberal tart of whiskey, and reached for the telephone. He'd obtained the number of Baines's home without undue difficulty and proceeded to dial it. The 
that a number appeared to be ringing, but there was no answer. Steed thought Baines wasn't at home, but he was. The trouble was he couldn't hear the telephone ring. The reason? Well, he was a hi-fi addict. Of course, being a considerate man, Baines only listened through headphones so that he didn't disturb the neighbors. A man in his early thirties, he was slumped in an easy chair, stirring a cup of cocoa. He reached out a thin hand and turned up the volume on his set. The telephone ringing was lost in the cacophony of sound. Also lost upon the unsuspecting Baines was the sound of the door being slowly forced open. The shadowy figure of a young man slipped into the room. The same young man, incidentally, who'd been darting in the night of the bushes at the research institute earlier that evening. Baines smiled contentedly, his eyes closed. Yet another mistake. The young man approached the armchair from the back. His hand stretched out suddenly and turned up the volume on Baines's headphones to full. his feet, tore off the headphones and flung them down. He swiveled around and found himself looking down the twin barrels of the shotgun that had been aimed with such devastating effect at poor George. Perhaps poor George was made of tougher metal after all. to Friday to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omen. The Avengers. Donald Monat as John Steed and Diane Appleby as Emma Peel is adapted and directed by Dennis Falbig and produced by David Gooden. <laughs>